A soldier's legacy is not defined by his time in battle, but his action between battles. There's a reason why Caesar's most famous words were his last. William Alexander, 1948, Secretary General of the United Nations. Hunting Trip Hunting is the oldest trade in the world. Prostitution might be the oldest profession, but you need something worth selling before you can buy anything, and hunting was the first job that made barter possible. Fruits were anywhere you could grab them, but meat needed skill and talent to get. Hunting also provided hide for clothes and bones for tools. Civilization was built on the farm, but society was made by the hunt. That was my mother's motto. She believed that if the world ended, the only survivors would be those who could hunt, and so she taught me how. Every year we would go hunting, and this year I invited some friends. I am not wearing that, Mary said when she saw me step out. I'm not asking you to, I said back. I was wearing a dress that was based off African tribal design, so it wasn't an exact match. I had made it myself, and so it had some modern influences in it, like pockets. Doesn't it get breezy underneath? I glared at her. I'm wearing undergarments. Good to know. Mary was dressed in modern clothes. Not really designed for outdoors, but they would do. She wore a hunter's orange vest on top of everything and was almost painful to look at directly, even in the dim light of dawn. Girls, are we ready? My mom asked as she joined us. She was donned in full tribal attire, including the absence of shoes. She was barefoot, where Mary and I had boots. Is that Alice girl still coming? She should be. Last I talked to her, she was wanting to come, I said. Well, I hope she shows soon. We can't wait all day. At that time, a car honk sounded from the road. Looking, I saw Alice stepping out of a car. She was dressed in full hunting camo, and on her back she carried her sword and a rifle. She waved farewell to her dad and jogged down to join us. Hey, girls. Sorry I'm late. Dad couldn't figure out how to get the car past first gear. It's fine. You're just in time, actually, I said, gesturing to my mom. Mama, this is Alice. My mother had a puzzled look on her face that made me confused. I didn't realize she was... white. Mama! I shouted, and Mary's eyes darted to the ground. Alice shifted in place. I'm sorry, I didn't... Alice blushed as she tried to find the right words. I was just about to find my own words when my mom spoke up again. Oh, no, 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 I didn't mean anything, she explained. It's just that a part of this is teaching my little Naz about our heritage. And when she said she wanted to invite some friends, well, I just assumed that. I understand, ma'am. I'm sorry if this is inconvenient. No, I'm sorry. Please. I'm Wangu, Virginia. But I often go by Wanda. I'm Alice Hansen. They shook hands. I would love to learn about your people's hunting traditions. My mother taught me to hunt before she died. She used to say hunters never starved. Wise woman, my mother smiled. Come along now, let's begin. We headed into the woods as my mother explained how we were headed to a campsite my mother and I had set up years ago. Wait, are we staying the night? Out here? Mary asked. I thought we were going back to your house after this. We will, tomorrow, I said. We'll spend tonight out here and then tomorrow at my house, and go to school on Monday. Oh, okay, Mary said in a mumble. Something wrong? I asked. It's fine. It's just I didn't tell my mom I was going to be gone two nights in a row, Mary explained. There's a landline at the campsite. I had it installed the first time we came out here, Mom said, and it brought back a memory of that year. And with it a voice purred in my mind. You walked off alone and got attacked by a wolf. Screamed loud enough to wake the dead. And me, of course. That's how we met. I ignored the voice. I couldn't speak back to her in my mind, and I didn't want to start talking to myself. Oh, fine then. I just wanted to be sociable. We continued walking until Mary tripped and yelped. 
Mary! Alice and I yelled and rushed to her. I'm fine. Mary huffed and puffed. I just lost my footing. Do you need to be carried? My mother asked. I had to carry Nazuri our first time out here. There's no shame in it. Oh, no. I don't want to be a burden. Mary started off, but Alice cut her off. Don't be ridiculous, Alice ensured. It's not a problem at all. I'll carry you. Alice pulled off her rifle and handed it to me. It was a thirty-two standard, the most mass-produced rifle in the world. Probably the most mass-produced weapon ever. Everyone knew how to handle one. I reflectively checked the safety and the chamber. It was loaded. Mama doesn't like me using guns, I said as Alice tied her sword around her waist belt. Sorry, if it's a problem I could, Alice said, but I cut her off. Don't be a hypocrite. Mama can deal with it. Carry Mary. I swung the rifle to my back, and Alice took Mary on hers. We continued until we finally made it to a clearing that was the campsite. It was wide with a circle of stone making a fire pit, and a set of logs as seating. On the far end stood a large five-foot metal cube. It was a site marker that declared this spot as our campsite. It wasn't a property marker. We didn't own the land, but we did legally have dibs. It was also an outdoor safe where the site's landline was secured. I checked the marker and noted there were things both missing and not here last time. A lot of basic supply and rations. A note was tied to the phone. Mary took it and read, Sorry and thank you. Who wrote this? Don't know. Likely never will, I said. That just happens sometimes. You call your mom. I'll help my mom and Alice set up. I left Mary to dial and join as they set down a heavy tarp. It was made of hemp, as was the tent, with bamboo supports. Mama always used material that we could have gotten from nature during our hunting trip, with a few notable exceptions. Alice had no trouble working the supports through the tent and securing it to the ground. Before long, the tent was up and ready just in time for Mary to rejoin us. Just one tent? Mary asked. Yeah. Would you rather be all alone in the dark of the night? I teased, and Mary frowned at me. I was just asking, Mary said, and I giggled. The sun had just lifted over the tree line when Mama said she was satisfied with the setup. We started the hunt, and Alice took the lead with my mom's blessing, and soon we found a clear set of deer prints. We followed the tracks with silent grace and came across a deer, a buck standing fifteen hands high. Alice aimed her rifle. We were all silent as we waited for her to shoot. We continued to be silent as Alice started to shake. She jerked, and the rifle rattled, startling the deer. It led the way and into the woods just out of sight. I'm sorry. I tried. I just... Alice seemed like she was about to cry, but my mom cut her off with a hug. It's okay. It's fine. We're not here to hunt. We're here to learn. You did amazing, Alice. Alice sniffed and stepped back. Thank you, Miss Virginia. Of course. Now, it's Mary's turn. What? Mary snapped. My turn for what? Tracking and hunting. Oh, yeah. Um, I don't know anything about that. Well, lucky for you, that's why we're out here, remember? I elbowed her. Mary's tracking was terrible. Alice and I had to practically do it for her. In the end, we managed to find another buck. Not as big, but still sizable. Okay, now what? Mary mouthed silently. I don't have a gun. I stepped up and pulled my bow and notched an arrow and gestured for her to step back. She did, and I aimed my bow. I took a deep breath and released. The arrow flew straight and in between the ribs. It cried out and fell over. Good shot! Alice cheered as Mary gasped. Oh my god! Mary covered her mouth. That's terrible! It is an unpleasant truth, my mom said as she walked past us to the deer. But it is the nature of the hunt. Come on, let's bag it. We all walked up to the now dead deer, and I saw I had shot it straight through the heart. I couldn't ask for a cleaner kill. 
Mom and Alice worked on tying it up, turning my mom's spear into a carrying pole. I went up to Mary. Hey, you okay? She nodded. Yeah, I'm just considering becoming a vegetarian. What, like a fairy? Don't let the boys hear about this. Adrian would flip. Adrian can suck my tit for what I care. But yeah, I'm just... This is the first time I've ever seen something die. First hand, at least. First hand? I noted her word choice. You mean you've seen death through your powers? Yeah, a few times. I've also seen people kill other people before. Oh, wow. Like you saw them do it? I asked and she nodded. I'm sorry to hear that. You've seen plenty of murders yourself, remember? I immediately walled the thought away. I did not want to talk to her right now. I was spending time with my mom and my friends. I didn't want to deal with her. All right, Naziri, you and Alice carry the deer. Take lead. We're heading back to camp. Mary, walk behind them. I'll take the rear. Mom ordered, and we all moved as she said. I handed my spear to her and lifted one end of the carrying pole. The deer's head was tied up to be secured to the pole by its antlers. Apparently, Alice didn't like having it flow about. I think Mary would have appreciated that if she knew about it. We walked through the woods. The sun was only just reaching high noon. The morning had been so active I didn't notice the time passing. I heard a whistling tune coming from my mom, an old marching cadence, and soon we were all singing along, filling the forest with a mediocre performance. Our spirits were high, and we marched along, carefree. We were blindsided by a brown bear. It seemed to jump out at us from nowhere with a roar. My mom brandished her spear, but the bear swatted it away. After that, a gunshot went off as Alice fired at it. She missed completely. The bear swung at her and threw her rifle out of her hand into a tree. I notched an arrow and fired, managing to hit it and even got a second and third shot off, but all three seemed to just bounce off. It looked at me. We could end this easily. Just accept my power and you can win. I walled the thought away and looked around. Mary was missing, Alice was unarmed, and Mom was still down. I saw the deer body and remembered the sphere. I stepped over and pulled the weapon out just in time to be knocked into the air by the bear. It scooped me in an uppercut its claws leaving tears in my skin. I landed in a bush that didn't break well and was dazed. I was terrified. Are you serious? You're going to die. Just let me help you. I couldn't keep the thought away. I was too panicked and pained to give any mental resistance. I didn't have a choice, really. Give in or give up. I was just about to call within when we were reminded that Alice wasn't actually unarmed. By the will of my blood! Alice cried as she lifted her sword. A bright light pulsed from it and engulfed her, turning her into light. Her body morphed as she grew in size, taller and buffer, her camo attire turned into armor. A breastplate with a plated skirt and boots to match. Her hair became braided and tight to her skull. She lifted her sword to the bear, and a voice that sounded like Alice only in pitch spoke. Be gone, beast. You shall have no mercy otherwise. The bear charged. It leaped on Alice, bringing its claws in full force down on nothing, as Alice stepped under its arm and swung. The bear jumped away, dropping to all fours and charging again for a tackle, only for Alice to step, not aside, but forward to stab the blade into its neck. The bear dodged just in time, but Alice didn't back off. She pursued and tried to strike away. This seemed to be the breaking point for the bear. It turned and fled into the woods. My first thought was of Mary. I called out to her and scanned the area. I found her easy enough, with her orange coat almost shining through the brush. Oh, sweet mercy. Mary, are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine, Mary answered with a voice that shook with the rest of her body. Sorry about that. I just froze and hid. No, Mary, it's fine. You're not a combatant. You shouldn't be apologizing. 
I said with shame. I should have... Nazuri! Mary! We have a problem, Alice said, kneeling where my mom was still lying on the ground. We walked over and could tell something was wrong. Her skin was a shade duller, and she was gleaming with sweat. What happened? I don't know. She's sweating a lot, but I can't tell more than that. Alice spoke with a flat firmness. She wasn't panicking or worried or anything. Her cold demeanor spread into me, and I took a breath. Look at her palm, where the skin stays light. I lifted her arm to show her palm had gone paper white. Alice looked at that and nodded. Blood flows down. She might be going into shock, Alice suggested. A bump on the head should cause this. What about a snake bite? Mary asked, raising my mother's foot. I was checking the sole of her feet, and look. She pointed to two small holes where bright red blood flowed out. Looks like it. What first aid do you two know? Alice said. Basic training? Disinfect and bandage? Mary said. I can do a tourniquet. Stop the poison from spreading, I said as I started to look for our supplies. No, the poison is already in her blood. That won't help, Alice said. We need to keep her still and get her to a medic. We need a stretcher, Mary said. We can make one with the spears and a tarp. Where do we get a tarp? I have one in my cadet kit. Hurry, we don't know how long we have, Alice said. I asked, what do you mean? That bear was not a simple beast. Alice looked out into the woods. I think it's hunting us. You're likely right, I agreed. That was a grizzly bear. They're not native to the east coast. It was also smart. Very smart, Alice said, surveying the area. I saw it in its eyes. An other being? I asked. The forest wasn't the hottest spot for otherness, but the beings of the other side could slip through anywhere. I don't know. It doesn't matter. It tried to kill us, Alice said and stood. Mary, your tarp. Mary pulled the tarp out of the cadet kit. It was thin but made of plastic that allowed it to be folded and tied to the spheres. I broke the tips off. They were useless, and I didn't want to slip and cut myself. Alice and I moved my mom over as Mary found my arrows and Ashley's rifle. One of the arrows broke, but the other two are intact. The rifle seems damaged, though. Mary handed our weapons back. I thanked her, but Alice waved her off. It's no good like that. Just more weight weighing us down. That's right. You need to take the rest of the supplies, too, I said to Alice. We need to keep Mom leveled, and you're too tall now. Me and Mary need to carry her, and any weight we can take off helps. Alice nodded. You're right. Leave the gun. I'll take the rest. Wait, what about... Mary said, but didn't have anything to follow. Quietly, she nodded in agreement and handed everything she could over. She was left with only the shirt on her back and the shining vest over it. We marched through the woods. Alice took the lead, sword at the ready. She used the blade as a tool to cut through brush and limbs to make the path clear and easy to walk. Each swing was quick and smooth, like the vegetation was nothing. This terrified me as I remembered that these very swings were the same swings the bear took like it was nothing. I began to wonder if Alice had missed her shot earlier. That worry was replaced when we returned to camp to find it destroyed. The tent was ripped apart and the fire pit was dismantled. But the most terrifying part was the sight marker. It was ripped entirely from the ground and lay twisted just a few feet away. There were deep claws in the inch-thick steel cutting through it. The landline had been pulled out and smashed. That was all I had time to survey when Mary started to give out. We set Mama down and Mary collapsed. I rushed to her and examined her. She was breathing heavily and her palms were bleeding. I'm okay. Just tired, Mary said between gasps. She looked at the scene herself. What happened? Sabotage, Alice said, checking the marker. That beast was here. It made its attentions clear. What do we do now? Mary asked. We have to head back to the road, I said. No, Alice said. 
If we went at the same pace as we came, we would make it only an hour before sunset. Carrying Wanda will slow us down, and Mary's exhaustion more so. We won't make it before dark. We'll remake camp and stay the night, and head out first thing in the morning. I was fuming, enraged at how right Alice was. Mary was barely holding up. She had gritted her teeth and made it here, but asking her to do that again was a no-go. I could carry Mama on my shoulders, but that would be rough on her, and I wasn't sure if I had the strength and stamina for it. Alice could have done it, but she was the only combatant we had. Either she carried as we followed, leaving herself open to an attack, or left us behind for the bear. Mama can't afford to wait, I shouted in vain. Yes, she can, was Alice's response. I yelled at her, the poison! Takes time, Alice cut me off. Snake bites are meant for much smaller creatures, and your mother is strong. She'll last the night. I know it. I was speechless. I gritted my teeth trying to scream something but broke down into tears. Mary stepped over and hugged me. She's right. Your mother's incredibly strong. They were right. But I didn't feel better. After a while, Alice started salvaging the campsite and Mary joined her. I stayed by Mama and watched the tree line for the bear. Mama started to stir. Naz? She whimpered. Mama! I leaned my head into hers. Mama, I'm here. What happened? We were attacked. You got bit by a snake. We carried you back to camp. We need to get back to... Mama tried to lift herself, but was too weak. No. You rest, Mama. Alice and me got this. Indeed, ma'am. Alice came up. You need to conserve your strength. We'll handle this. The phone, Mama said. Destroyed. Alice informed her. We need to wait out the night, and tomorrow we'll make our way back. We put the tent back up and set Mama inside. Started a fire and ate what we could. Mama and Mary got fed first and I only ate enough to keep the hunger away. Alice skipped altogether, claiming her body is trained to go long times without food. Alice kept watch all night, again claiming she was trained to keep up when needed. She seemed trained to do everything. I was lying in the tent, trying to will myself to sleep when she came back. You know, I could handle this easily. If you only accept my offer, I can save your mother. I scoffed and whispered, How? Can you heal poison? No, but I can run at incredible speeds. And I'm strong. Plus, I can see in the dark. I'm not leaving Alice and Mary behind to fend for themselves. Oh, yeah. Running away. I could do that, too. But I was talking about fighting. You think you can take that thing? I know I can. I could skin it alive and strangle it with its own hide. You only have to let me. No dice. I'm not giving you my body. And I'm not leaving Mary or Alice behind. I'm sorry, came another voice. Mary hadn't gone to sleep yet. I'm sorry I can't help. I'm not. I could hear the tears in her voice. I rolled over to face her. Mary, it's okay. You're doing what you can, and that's more than enough. No, it's not. Mary smoothed out a sob. I was made the leader of our team. I'm supposed to be doing more than just struggling to follow along. She continued to cry as I tried to say something. But it was her who spoke again. I know you're struggling with something. Whatever it is that you're talking to. I know it's using me to pressure you. I'm sorry. I didn't know what to say, so I reached over and placed a hand on her arm. We'll make it. Sleep. You'll need all the grit you can muster. You can do that. I know you can. With that, she nodded and closed her eyes. You know... I threw the voice into a safe and built a fortress around it. I was done talking to her. I didn't need her. I didn't want her. I built a moat around the fortress as I finally willed myself to sleep. 
The next morning, Alice woke up before the sun had even fully rose to prepare. We had made a better stretcher and put Mama on it using the hemp tarp and some extra sticks for support. It was here last night, Alice said as we set everything up. What? When? Some time before midnight. It just watched us before slipping away again. I could have pursued, but it would have been a trap, Mary said. She had awoken and joined us without me noticing. If not a literal one, then one to get us alone for a second something. You think it's not alone? I asked. I don't know, but it's not unreasonable to think. Alice nodded and we finished preparing for the trip. Alice took the lead again, and Mary and I followed. Mama had started to lose more color. Her bold, earth-toned skin had now turned an ashy gray, and her dress had been drenched in sweat. Her breathing was shallow, but she was still breathing, and I was not going to let her die out here. I felt myself fill with resolve as we entered the tree line, and appreciated that the path was cleared and well-worn from our many trips out here. I knew exactly where we were, and that at our current pace we would reach the road just before noon, if we could keep our pace. But before long, Alice told us to stop. What? I asked reflectively. Trip wire, Alice answered, and pointed to a string floating across the path. It was plain to see in the daylight, but had we come through in the dark, it likely would have been too late before we saw it. Alice stepped forward with sword ready. She was about three feet from the string when the real trap went off. Before the simple string was a sewing thread, just fine enough to be unseen. In fact, I didn't see it, but rather it pulling on the brush. A tension line snapped and swung a knife aimed directly at Alice's spine. It slammed into her, making her step forward into the first string, making it snap, and it was over. The moment passed. On the ground laid a knife made of stone and snapped in half. It had struck Alice directly, but her armor blocked it easily. The first string was just a distraction. Everything was fine, and I was struggling to keep it together. Alice, I said shaking, I'm fine. Come on. They'll know we're here, was all she said, and she started as we followed. We started to pick up the pace but we found ourselves slowing down, one part watching for traps, one part from Mary losing strength, but she kept her grit and continued onward. Before long, we saw another trip line, clear in the daylight. Alice reached for her waist and pulled a combat knife out. Flipping it and catching the blade, she cocked her arm and threw it, cutting the line. I spent one second thinking it was a waste when I heard the gunshot. It was just off to the side of the path. A single shot that would have gotten Mary or me in the back of the head if we had gotten up to it. What the fuck was that? Mary cried as Alice went into the brush. She reached in and pulled out the thirty-two standard rifle we had left behind, which triggered yet another trap. Another tension line with a stone knife, which Alice blocked with her sword. I'm starting to get annoyed. Alice scoffed. Good! Happy to hear it. Can we get going? I shouted as Ella slammed the rifle into a tree at just the wrong angle, snapping the rifle in half. Yes, she picked up her knife, and we continued. At about halfway, we found yet another string. How many did that fuck make? I shouted as Alice readied her knife again. Whatever happens, can we rest? Mary called. She was breathing heavily. Yeah, we're halfway there. We can rest. Mary and I set Mama down, and Alice approached the line. Mama wasn't moving, and I was about to panic as I checked her pulse. Horrible, icy terror filled me as I checked. Only the smallest relief came to me when the slow, shallow, but steady beats pulsed in her neck. I sighed and looked to Mary. She was breathing heavily, and sweat had covered her face. She wiped the sweat away with gloved hands. Hey, where did those come from? I asked, pointing to her hands. Oh, they were in the sight marker. She showed the gloves off. 
They were black cotton and made for a grown man. Figured they'd help with my grip. That's smart, I said. I don't think I would have thought of that. Before Mary could reply, the sound of a bell rang through the trees. I looked and saw another tension line with a bell on it. Before I asked why, I pulled my knife and turned around to find the answer. A man had jumped out of the brush and started to grow in size. I threw my knife over Mary's head, screaming, Behind us! At five paces, it landed blade forward into the now bear. It winced and pulled the knife out, revealing a flow of blood, but then readied itself again, only for Alice to leap over us and thrust our sword into the beast, sending it back. We need to move, I said, grabbing my end of the stretcher. But what if there's a second beast, or this one escapes Alice? Mary had misunderstood me. I had only meant to give Alice space to fight. But a thought came to me. Mary was most likely starting an adrenaline rush. She would be stronger, faster, and steadier until she crashed. After that, who knows? It was a gamble. Win, and we save Mama. Lose, and I would have to save us. I can handle it. Whatever happens, come on. Nazuri, Mary said as the fight raged on. I can handle it. I repeated, readying my grip. Mary, please. I had my back to her now. And so I only felt the weight of the stretcher rise up, and we started again. We didn't call back. Didn't want to distract Alice or announce ourselves to the bear. So we started down. I watched the path with intense focus, relying on my instincts to guide us, and Mary to keep watch. We were jogging through the woods, and after a while I felt it. Mary's strength had waned, and she was stumbling now near collapse. I thought quickly. We're almost there. A few more bins. I half lied. We had only a quarter of the way to go, but I felt Mary grit her teeth and she continued, marching one foot at a time. We had started slowing down, but I continued to call back encouragement. Each call worked less and less. Mary eventually started crying, but she continued. One by one, step by step, bend over bend, her steps became limps when I saw a flash through the trees. A flame of hope rose inside of me. I see the car! I shouted, and Mary summoned the very last of her strength, and in one final push we made it out. We got to the car and set Mama down. Mary collapsed, heaving and sobbing. I checked Mama again, alive. I checked the car, and the fire of hope dimmed. The inside was destroyed. The dashboard was ripped out. Wires dangled. If I had known enough, I might have been able to salvage the car and drive away. But I knew nothing about cars. Not even how to drive. I took the deepest breath I could and opened the car door. The driver window was bashed, pointless since we left it unlocked. I reached to the bottom of the console and lifted it up, revealing an emergency phone. You can survive anything as a hunter. Except being stupid. Communication was the hunter's greatest tool. I picked up the phone and dialed the only button on it. Dial emergency service. The line answered. Emergency helpline, go. SOS, I have a snake bike victim and exhaustion. We're being attacked. Demi-human, I think. Okay, sir, what is... The line went out and came back with another voice. Department of Demi-human, is this Mary Bitter? Mutant type of Progress City? Yes, I didn't bother correcting them. Understood. Do not hang up. We have your signal. Oh, thank you, God. I sighed and allowed everything to come out. Fat streams of tears flowed out of my eyes as I broke down at the sobs. I took a breath and shouted out, Help is on the way! Yes, ma'am. You said you were being attacked. Can you describe further? Yes. I told them everything I could, going into smaller and smaller details. The operator never once berating me. Even when I went over how a stone knife was snapped in half and how Mary was wearing gloves. I did have to clarify who I actually was, but they weren't upset. Okay, ma'am. We'll have agents to you in just another few minutes. That's when I heard the sound of fighting. I spoke into the phone. They found us. 
You may defend yourself however you see fit, but please keep the line open. I dropped the phone and readied myself. I searched for whatever I could. Mary had recovered and was taking care of Mama. I saw Mama's own knife, a full steel knife tied to her thigh, another exception she made. I pulled it out and readied myself. You don't need that. I have my own weapons built in. Just take my deal and see for yourself. She was right. A knife alone was nothing. I said I could handle this. Now it was time to prove it. I took a deep breath and closed my eyes and started to reach down. Then I was interrupted by an eagle that had swooped down and over and only a few paces away morphing into a man. I brandished my knife and started to pull up the power when he lifted a hand. Hold that, Negro. I come to help. His words stunned me for a moment. Negro was an old word for African people, but it was uncommon in modern speech. I looked the man over. He was old and dressed in overalls. His face was wrinkly and red. A native. I am known as Wise Eagle. And I fear I know who attacks you. You do? I shouted and readied my knife again. But before he could answer, the fight broke out of the tree line. Alice and the bear were bloody with slashes all over. The bear roared and stepped over to come down on us. I screamed and shielded at Mama. But the bear roared in pain and fell back. I looked up and saw a stone axe was now in the bear's chest. Enough, boy! You are done here! Wise Eagle said behind me. The bear rolled over and away, and a shine of magic came over it, and its physical form morphed down into a man, young and lean, with also red skin, wearing nothing but a pair of blue jeans. He was still bloody, and the axe still stuck in him. Grandfather! Why do you... was all the boy said when a rock struck him. Palm sized it had come from the old man. Quiet! I'll hear nothing from you, strong bear. Wise Eagle had stepped up to Neil. I am sorry for my grandson. He will be punished by our law. Why did he attack us? Mary asked as Wise Eagle pulled a medicine jar and opened it. Hateful he is. Powerful and stupid, too. Believes he decides right and wrong. He scooped an ointment out of the jar. This won't cure poison, but provide strength. It should help. They don't belong here, the young man screamed. Why should we allow them to come on our lands? We allow nothing, Wise Eagle shouted. I and all your elders allow them to come. You have no right to do this. Now go. I'll deal with you later. No, I'll deal with you now and Strong Bear stepped forward with magic flowing around him until the sun itself came down on him. We were in shock as the bright light around Mr. Galacto dimmed to just a glow. We looked with awe at him, except Strong Bear, whose face was fearful and even panicked. You know me? Mr. Galacto asked, and Strong Bear nodded. Good. Mr. Galacto turned away from him and walked to us. Miss Virginia, Miss Bitter, he looked to Alice. Miss Hanson, I'm sorry I wasn't here sooner. We've only been looking for about two hours now when Miss Bitter, your mother, called to report Mary missing. Hey! Strong Bear shouted. You can't just... Young man, Galacto didn't look back. You can stay or leave. I don't care. This is out of your power scale. You can't interfere in such personal matters. I am their teacher at West Progress High. I have the right to defend when needed. Call the Board of Education if you must. Bullshit! Strong Bear stepped forward, only to be frozen by a glare from Mr. Galacto. The boy lost his nerve and turned away and ran into the woods. That was when we heard the sirens. It was over. We were safe. Mama was going to be all right. That evening in the hospital, I was sitting next to Mama's bedside. 
They had given her anti-venom and other drugs to help her pull through. She was still asleep when Alice and Mary joined me. They had both been admitted, Alice for her wounds and Mary for exhaustion. But they both were fine now. Alice had returned to her normal size and had bags under her eyes now. Nazuri, how's your mom doing? Good. She'll make it. I looked to them. Thank you. Both of you. You both put so much on the line for me. And... It's okay, Naz. Alice put her hand on her shoulder. No, it's not. I could have handled this by myself, but I didn't. I started to tear up. I did it because... I understand. I do, Alice reassured me. Then the moment was interrupted by the door being kicked in and Adrian stepping through. He strided over and somehow scooped all three of us up. By damnation itself, I just heard the most badass story ever! Adrian, what are you doing here? I asked. Checking on my teammate, of course! He said, setting us down. He pointed to Alice. Hanson, I owe you three. One for both my teammates, and a third for Nazuri's mama. That's not needed, Alice said. I know. Still. Three. He flexed three fingers out. And how did you know we were here? Mary asked. Mary's mama called everyone. Lucas coordinated a search for the city. Then the report came in and we all rushed here. I looked back to see the rest of my team. Then Lucas told us everything that happened. How? Lucas said, I was given a copy of your call. Ashley whined until I told everyone. You were amazing! Ashley cheered as she bounced into place behind Lucas. But we told you we were camping, Mary pointed out. Yeah, Kevin shrugged. But doing nothing wasn't an option. So we wasted our time double-checking the city. And I took the initiative to check further out, Mr. Galacto said, stepping in. I was in Egypt when the call came through. Flew over at Mach 1. Saw Mary's glowing vest and, well, you were there. Oh man, you have to tell us everything! Adrian cheered. This woke Mama, and I heard her stirring behind me. Naz? She mumbled and I shot over. I'm here, Mama. I grabbed her hand and squeezed. Later then, Adrian shrugged and turned to head out. Everyone followed, but he stopped Mary. You're not staying? Should I? Mary asked, to which Adrian just shrugged. Naziri, are you okay? Mama mumbled. Of course I am. You're the one in the bed, Mama. I should have protected you. As your mother. You did, Mama. Your training and teaching saved us. I kissed her hand. Thank you. Naziri. I love you. And with that, Mama went limp. And her hand slipped out of mine. Mama? Mama! I started to panic. I was about to scream when Mary grabbed my shoulder. Naz, she said, and pointed over to the heart monitor, still beeping away. She's asleep. That was the breaking point. At that moment, all the fear and dread that had frozen over my mind and body and soul melted into a wave of hot relief. My mother was alive and safe. I broke down into sobbing laughter and hugged Mary, burying my face into her shoulder. We did it.